Well, let's, at this many... point, let's go for some actual, uh, some polling information. Um, now, BBC NOP uh, conducted a poll, not an exit poll, but a poll on voting intentions and various other matters. Now, Peter's knows some information on that. Peter. Well, right, and we can take the uh, picture of what the Scottish Parliament would look like. It's a little bit further forward as a result of this poll. We talked to 2,000 people on the telephone, NOP talked to 2,000 people on the telephone over the last couple of days, and they asked them the question, if there were to be a Scottish Parliament, and you were voting members into a Scottish Parliament, how would you vote? And here's what they came up with. Quite interesting. Remember how thoroughly the Labour Party wiped out of the general election with 46% of the vote. 51% said they would vote Labour. 24%, up two on the general election, said they would vote SNP. The Tories, down at 15%, 18% of the general election, and the Liberal Democrats down there on 9%. Now that means Labour and the SNP will be doing rather better inside this Parliament building than the picture I showed you a moment ago, which was of the uh, Labour Party and the SNP and the Tories filling the Parliament on the basis of the last general election. Let's just have a look what it would look like. Let's go into those doors again. Hope you like our design for the Parliament, by the way, for the second time. In we go through the doors. Here's our proportionally uh, representation elected Parliament, and let's just see how many Labour members we would have now. Here we are, here's this fully devolved parliament within the UK, look at the Union Jack still up there on the wall. Here we have the red Labour figures and they're getting up towards the winning post, they're through it. 66 Labour members there would be on the basis of our poll, well, if people really believe what they say, they would do it and vote Labour in. 12 uh, Liberal Democrats there, there's the SNP, rather more members, um, MSPs from the SNP, members of the Scottish Parliament, 33 of them. The Tories still represented, but rather fewer than we th saw earlier at 18, we saw 22 under the general election uh, vote. And here now we have the figures, 66, 12, 33 SNP and 18 Tories. There goes the winning post. I don't know whether you can just see the colour there, but there are three Labour members here on the other side of the House, quite clearly through the winning post, 129 members, Labour with a majority, if people voted as they told us they would over the last couple of days. Peter Kellner, put some more analysis on that for us. There are two things going on here. The first is this poll is conducted while Labour is still very much in its honeymoon. Look at Britain-wide polls this week. ICM puts Labour at 60% across Britain. A Gallup tonight, Labour at 58 The real election of the Scottish Parliament will happen in 18 months' time. The honeymoon will be over. I think it would be astonishing, and I think George Robertson would admit to being astonished if Labour was to have enough votes to have an outright majority. The second thing is that people, a lot of people, do think of voting differently for a Scottish Parliament as for a Westminster Parliament. Something like a quarter of the people NFP spoke to gave different answers. And the, uh, when you net it all out, what happens is the Scottish Nationalists do better and the Conservatives worse when they're asked about a Scottish Parliament than about Westminster. Well, we uh, haven't had any results yet, so we'll be able to put a bigger picture uh, on what's actually happening tonight very soon but we can now go over to but just before we go to Alan Mackay and Edward, I just want to give you one bit of information Renfrewshire turnout is 62.8 percent Alan Mackay in Edinburgh now yes Christy we've um, been getting these figures coming through in the last few minutes and all I can say is that uh, the the pro devolutions here are absolutely delighted about these turnout figures they were quite concerned in the last few days of the campaign that the turnout might be poor they say these are much better than they'd expected. Smiles came across their faces. The atmosphere down here in the foyer is really building up to that first result coming through. In the meantime, perhaps some uh, light relief. I'm joined by uh, Una McLean, who's probably been in more Scottish panthers than she'd care to remember, and Ronnie Brown, who's sung Flower of Scotland almost as often. Una, I believe you'd have been working for the SES campaign. You've been too busy. I've been too busy. Yeah, I, I mean, I gave my name to it, but uh, I'd love to have helped done more in a practical way but I'm at Pottlotty Festival Theatre but I got down tonight to show face and vote as did Russell Hunter but he had to go back up to perform tonight and I'm delighted this is a very historic occasion and I'm delighted to be here. You'll be back to work tomorrow? Back to work tomorrow doing uh, Mrs Warren's profession yes. What's been the atmosphere like in Pottlotty? Well um I don't really know, actually, because I've been too busy in the theatre. Uh, but mo most actors want it, yes, yes, I have to say, yes. But I don't know about the local people. Ronnie, I think you'd probably have preferred uh, a Scottish Assembly to come 20-odd uh, years ago, but, but if it happens tonight up Scottish Parliament, will it have been worth that wait? Oh, fantastic. I'm, I'm so pleased to see it in my own lifetime. And, and it's a particularly good night for Luna because she was here in 1707 <laughs> when we lost the Parliament, so it would be nice to see it back again. Yes. <laughs> Did, did no, I, I remember way, way back when I was a boy in the early 50s, walking around uh, 
the, the mound, you know, at nights, uh, chatting up the girls, you know, and they didn't have much success. We went and barracked Wendy Wood and the Scottish Patriots, oh, which was on a wee soapbox. You'll remember that. And everybody shouted, ah, you no chance, no chance, it'll never happen. And here it is, it's going to happen. But of course, it's only in a ste one step in the right direction. Committed Scots uh, like yourself though, must have wondered, particularly when you were singing those famous patriotic songs, if it would ever come. Aye, but you know, the reason we kept singing it was because we knew it would. Otherwise, we're fighting against thunder, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to sing for us tonight? Well, if somebody asks me, I'll know that I'll have to. Yeah. I think if I'm still awake. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe keep that in reserve for <laughs> later on. Isn't it wonderful that I, to, to have waited all this time and it's going to happen? I just know it's going to happen. Yes. That's why I'm wearing red for victory as a security. Ro Ronnie, uh, eh? oh, was I talking Ronnie, why, why, why are you in your kilt? I've seen you in your kilt many oh, times. That's very subtle, you see, because everybody knows my image, so I thought I'd do something modern. And this is a, a, a Scottish handcrafted, hand painted tie, so it's very, it's very subtle. You see. Okay, thank you both. As I say, the atmosphere down here in the foyer is really building up. Many people are heading up to the, the theatre area upstairs where the first declaration will be announced by the counting officer. Now back to the studio. Alan, before we leave you, have you any idea of when that first declaration might be made? We, we haven't spoken to Neil McIntosh for the last few minutes, but we understand that it could be as soon as five minutes' time from now. So I think in the, in the next few minutes you'll see many people going up to the theatre to take their seats, and, and we, we must wait to see what that first result will be, to see the reaction to it. And where indeed it will be from. Alan Mackay, thank you very much indeed. We now go over to East Renfrewshire, where Kenny MacDonald awaits. Kenny. Yes, the first process, the process of verification and finding out exactly how many people voted has now been completed. It's my understanding that the turnout in East Renfrewshire was 68.2%, higher than originally anticipated. And that would seem to play into the hands of the Yes Yes camp. I think they'll be very happy with that. It's about 10% lower than the turnout at the general election when Jim Murphy was elected to the first Labour MP here and, and uh, defeated uh, the Conservative in what was the safest Conservative seat in Scotland. So I think the Yes Yes campaign are feeling a lot more relaxed, particularly about the, the second Yes here in East Renfrewshire. Kenny, when do you expect uh, your first result? We hear from uh, Alan that we're expecting a result in five minutes. Do you think you're anywhere near that? I don't think so. I think we're looking at now what, what has happened is they've been divided up now into, into the white ballot papers. Those are the ones on the, the question of the Parliament itself and the green ballot papers which are the question of tax varying powers. And I think what, what you'll see is I think the declaration is going to be closer to about quarter to one here. Thank you very much indeed. Now let's just take a summary at this stage. No results. But turnout. Let's have a look now. The summary. First official turnout, 58% reported in Murray. Clackmannan, 66%. South Lanarkshire, 63%. Renfrewshire, 63%. And on top of that, as you've just heard Ken McDonald say, in East Renfrewshire, 68.2%. Brian, what do you make of these various turnouts? They're down on general election figures, but they're, they're, they're up in some cases considerably up on the sort of level that one sees at local election turnouts, so we can make what we will of that. Uh, we, we also have the factor to bear in mind that the register upon which this is based is now quite considerably out of date. You get the factor called degradation. In other words, people move from the area they're in, they're not listed on the new register, and perhaps the register isn't 100% up to date. In other words, a maximum turnout might have been between 85 and 90 rather than 100%, because it just simply wasn't the case that everybody was there potentially to vote. So if it's in the mid-60s, that's pretty good, it's pretty high, and, and probably gives the, the indication, if, if the differential turnout factor is right, probably gives the indication that the yes voters are turning out in, in strength. Well, particularly, let's look at East Renfrewshire, 68% turnout, much higher. That might indicate that either the no voters, conservative voters generally, have come out in strength, or indeed they've stayed at home, and the yes vote is much higher than we would have expected in what is essentially, apart from having a Labour MP, a Tory area. A former Tory area, but also an area where there is a tradition of, of substantial turnout, uh, an area where people are inclined to vote, and so consequently that, ha that habit may be carrying on. Although, of course, a referendum is a very different sort of beast from the general election. It, it, it isn't loyalty voting. People are voting very much on the questions set before them, and so we can't really make that direct comparison. But the, the suggestion we have from other uh, signs, from talking to the parties, from analysis of, of, of figures going on behind the scenes, is that there is this differential turnout. It, it is those who are perhaps generally inclined to vote yes, who are saying, I'm going to go for it, I'm going to go out and vote, and those who are, well, I'm not very keen on this parliament, who are either voting no or, in fact, staying at home. Right, let's have a quick word on that, Peter Kellner. The last referendum, 18 years ago, it failed because there was this 40% hurdle. The yes vote had to be 40% of the total electorate. Now, if the recent opinion polls are anything like right, it may well be that that 40% hurdle will be passed tonight, at least on question one. And I think if it is, 
then I think even if the turnout is down on the general election, it will put paid to the arguments about legitimacy. Now, overall, overall, we're expecting the predicted turnout nationally now is 62%. John Swinney. There's a very important difference about this referendum and the one in 1979. This referendum is taking place on a register which is about 10, 11 months old, whereas the referendum in 1979, the, re the register was very fresh. Now, the turnout appears to be broadly comparable to the turnout in 1979, which I think is a, is a splendid achievement uh, on the, 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 of the campaign and something which shows quite clearly that the Scottish people will have responded positively to this test of their opinion. But what you would be expecting then, as Peter Snow's graphics were showing earlier, would you be expecting quite a difference on the second question, despite all the, all the um, refusal to um, countenance any scaremongering by the No campaign? Well, I think there will be a difference between the, the, the first question, I think, will be won very decisively, and the second question, I think, will be won uh, by a narrower margin. But uh, we'll have to wait and see how the counts progresses to the extent to which that becomes narrow. But the fact is, in the white paper on tax, there were... Well, there was a lack of clarity. Let's look at local taxation. It is open to a parliament to abolish the council tax. It is open to a parliament to change the nature of business rates. It is open to a parliament to produce completely fresh taxes, sales tax, tourist tax. So, in fact, people didn't know what they were getting. Well, in some respects, the No campaign has just been a negative campaign which has tried to play in people's fears. Now, obviously, if there had been more clarity, if we'd had a bill in front of us, those points might have been clearer and the margin of success may have been more su substantial. But it's a point which shows how pathetic the No campaign has been, that even on those basis... Well, we'll, pick that, we'll pick that up with Michael Ankerman. We must go over now uh, to Anne McKenzie at the conference centre. Anne. Yes, Kirsty, uh, news here is that we're expecting a declaration in a very short time, uh, perhaps within the next five minutes. As you can see, the, the hall is beginning to fill up. People are beginning to move up from the foyer um, in anticipation of that first result. We understand that the Scottish Secretary, Donald Dewar, has arrived at the conference centre. Certainly, um, Alex Salmond has been here for some time, the SNP leader. And, uh, we are told that uh, the way we know that an announcement is coming is 15 seconds or so of extremely raucous music, which uh, we haven't actually heard yet. But uh, we will, when that happens, Neil McIntosh, the, uh, the chief returning officer, will walk onto the stage the first of uh, 32 times he's going to be coming on. He's going to be quite a familiar friend by the time we finish this evening. And uh, we think it will either be Clack Manager or East Renfrew, as you've already said very much indeed and now we're at a very important moment of the night the moment of the night where we can actually put some detail and some data and make some estimation of the direction uh, of the night now here is Peter Snow for this key moment uh, yes it's just a sort of turnout moment though because it's not the great moment where the any moment the any it's, moment is, a, is an interesting moment it's a very important moment you're quite right anyway let's have a look at the turnout just going back over history and then see where we are uh, look what we are tonight here then is the uh, turnout uh, in the early years of referenda, they should be there, but they're not coming up because my little computer has decided it's uh, going a bit sick just for a second. Let's just see if we can get it to work again. I'm running behind here to turn it round. No, I'm going to have to pass over to you, Kirsty, and come back in two minutes. Well, well what, what, the, what the key moment would have been would have been to say that now we have a national figure for turnout, so we can actually put up a winning post. The number of votes that need to be cast for there to be either a yes or a no vote in the first question and a yes and a no vote in the second question. Now we're joined uh, by uh, Lord Mackay of um, Ardbrechnish. John Mackay, you put your gloss on uh, what has been happening over the last 24 hours when it seems, as Peter Fraser, Lord Fraser, said tonight, that he conceded on the first question. I'm not going to concede on anything when the result is this close. I think uh, there's no point in making predictions. But, uh, you know, if they can't win when three of the four political parties in Scotland are with them, when every tabloid and every broadsheet, especially the broadsheets, have been just fanatically for them. I mean, the Herald and the Scotsman have read more like the in-house magazines of the Yes, Yes campaign. Frankly, if they can't win on these terms, then uh, I don't know who could ever win an election. Do you think uh, that uh, against that, if you'd had such figures as the very architect of the Tartan tax, Michael Forsyth out, if you'd had Markham Rifkind out, if you'd had Ian Lang out, then okay. you might have had a higher profile well, uh, no-no <coughs> campaign? Uh, Malcolm was out. I, I watched him on television, I think, last night, and certainly... Uh, Ian for the Lang, first time in the an campaign. article in, in the newspapers. I think they made a, a decision that. Um, <laughs> I think they made a decision that they, they had just lost their seats. And frankly, I think, Kirsty, with all due respect, if they had appeared much in the campaign, you would have kept reminding them that they'd lost their seats. So I think it was quite uh, sensible that they allowed other people to take, uh, the, to take the lead 
on this campaign. But didn't the, the no campaign in essence in the last uh, 24 hours or so get rather bitter? I mean, John Major talked about dishonesty in the Yes campaign. A leading Think Twice campaigner talked about the press. Margaret Thatcher well, I've just talked remarks. about the press. I think the press have been pretty one-sided and they haven't even been very good at reporting the broader picture and the broad arguments. They've been very obsessed. Now, I've been twice on television this week and what struck me is the best arguments, admittedly, in both occasions it was Labour politicians I was against, but the best arguments they could put to the people who were in the programme was uh, that this is another way to kick the Tories. You're going to have a second kick at the Tories. You got them on the 1st of May, have another kick today. And that was about the... the that was about the peak of the argument we managed to get on the subject. So do you believe, uh, Brian Wilson, a number of people have said, of course, that what they have is in front of them is a white paper and they do not know the bones of it. And there are some concerns about that. And also that you know, one of the arguments of the No campaign was, why did you not publish the bill and then have a referendum? I mean, there must be some validity in that. People might think you're going to change the prospectus if you get a parliament. No, I don't think there's any validity uh, in it because what the, the Tories demanded, really, um, and, and we acceded to, um, was that as soon as possible we should go to the electorate and test the, the, the public will, which is precisely what we've done. And I think these, uh, I think actually quite extraordinary turnout figures that we're seeing um, confirm that people have been engaged in the argument, they've understood what's going on, and they, they don't suffer from this confusion which is spoken of. And the real failure of the, of the No campaign is that everyone else has worked to achieve a Scottish consensus, and therefore the No campaign has been synonymous with the Tories. Well, let's get, a look, let, let's get a look at uh, the atmosphere around the country. We're very close to declaration, and uh, bring in Brian Taylor to talk here. Let's uh, now look, there's the party. People are settling down now to wait for the first result. Uh, that's the Scotland Forward Party pack there. There is alcohol there, and unfortunately for the ones at uh, the Edinburgh International Conference Centre, apparently there's absolutely no alcohol there. So we can see people there uh, ready to enjoy themselves, waiting now for the first result. And moving over now to Carlton Hill, in front of a brazier, it's much colder out there. A number of people waiting, still car horns, tooting and so forth as they wait, and indeed they do have... I just saw the, uh, a leading member of the Welsh campaigner, Marie Davis, who took part in uh, the debate last night. People milling around there, waiting and now looking back to the conference hall now it's packing up there there's no there's no shortage of people there coming in faces right across there people concerned about uh, making sure they're there for the very first very first result now it could be clackman it could be murray what would they tell us brian i think we'll get the declaration fairly shortly kirsty and the indications are are that it might be the 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 black man and uh, result that was the one certainly we expected all along i'll perhaps pick up some of the points that were made in the discussion um, previously there, I mean, we're, we're, we're being told that the, that the campaign coverage was very much towards the yes side. Well, that may have been the case in some of the, the Labour supporting papers, but um, we, we should recall that the early stage of the campaign was dominated by coverage of allegations of Labour sleaze in Paisley and Glasgow, and the early stage of the campaign was also dominated by a, a row over the, the, the alleged implications of the so-called tartan tax when Sir Bruce Botello of the Bank of Scotland came in. So it wasn't exactly the glowing start for the, for the Yes campaign that perhaps they would have wished, and, and certainly the coverage was very much dominated in the early phases by those. And of course, at the very last minute, the Express came out for a parliament. The Daily the, Mail uh, you know, stayed in its, its position, but the Express came out uh, for a parliament at the very last minute. The Express minute, was which... edging that way throughout the campaign, but you're quite right, it kept its, its verdict until the, until the end. The, the Scotsman at various points was was putting sceptical opinions uh, following the, the, the declared intention to, to put a quizzical eye upon the devolution scheme. Um, I make no comment about, about the other ones, but certainly just to, 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 just to counteract the impression that it was all uh, towards the yes side, it was an absolute stinker of a beginning for them. And I recall the, the launch of the Scotland Forward uh, news conference, uh, which turned into a quite remarkable event uh, at, at which... Uh, Various members of the media were accused of, of ill behaviour or whatever, but there we are. Well, well uh, let's uh, turn to one person who's never been accused of ill behaviour, and that is Jeremy Vine, and with him he has a number of politicians. Jeremy, over to you. Thank you very much indeed for that, Kirsty. Yes, indeed, three politicians with me here at Westminster. Peter Hay, let me start with you, Welsh Office Minister. Um, if this turns out to be the first step to independence, would you regret that? Yes, because I don't think it will be it will be the first step towards decentralizing power and that's what's exciting about this throughout the United Kingdom bringing decision-making closer to people where Scotland is leading today Wales will follow and lead in its own way next week I'm sure and then that process will gradually spread throughout England so that we have a Britain that is at ease with itself and which in which decisions are closer to the people rather than being decided centrally by the likes of John Redwood as they were over those long, bitter Tory years. And John Redwood, what right has your party got to oppose devolution in Scotland when it can't get elected there? 
Well, we have every right to put a strong democratic case to the people of Scotland. We believe in proper devolution, allowing individuals, families, companies to make more decisions for themselves, having less government. One of the most objectionable features of the Labour proposals for Scotland and Wales is that they're saying they want more politicians and more bureaucrats meddling with people's lives and spending money on things that aren't so important diverting the money away from the things that really but, matter, but you've like been, the you've health been, service. You've been through all those arguments, and as we see from our pictures of the I program tonight, the um, they failed. Uh, but don't come back on that yet, because we've got a handbag. Mm. Kirsty does a declaration. Clack Manon is about to declare. We go declare straight over to the Edinburgh result. International Conference Centre, where we can hear from the returning show. officer, Neil McIntosh. The turnout of electors was 66.1% of those yeah. eligible to vote. Here is the result for the first ballot. The votes cast for I agree that there should be a Scottish Parliament, 18,790, representing 80% of the ballot. <laughs> The votes cast for I do not agree that there should be a Scottish Parliament, 4,706, representing 20% of the valid votes cast. Rejected ballot papers, 118. Here is the result for the second ballot. The votes cast for I agree that a Scottish Parliament should have tax-varying powers, 16,112. <laughs> 16,112, representing 68.7% of the valid votes passed. The votes cast for I do not agree that a Scottish Parliament should have tax-varying powers, 7,355, representing 31.3% of the valid votes cast. Rejected ballot papers, 136. That completes the declaration for Clack Manager. So there we have it. Clack Manon, Scotland's smallest mainland council in the centre of Scotland, has voted yes, yes. Let's look at those figures in some detail now. The majority on the question of a parliament, 14,000. The majority on the question of tax powers, 8,700. That's a turnout of 66%. Let's look at the share of the vote there now. 80% voted for a Scottish parliament against 20%. And 69% against 31% voted for tax powers. Brian Taylor. Kirsty, this is, this is obviously a tiny vote in some senses. It's, as you said, the smallest mainland uh, council known as the Wee County. Indeed, uh, when it was first set up at, in the reorganisation, some doubted whether it should exist at all. It was suggested it was part of gerrymandering by the Conservatives in the previous set up. But nonetheless, the percentage figures are quite startling. Well, let, well let's just, let's just keep, 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 you know, keep giving some more detail about it, but let's look over at the reaction uh, of the people there. Slightly yeah. delayed reaction from They're the people at the They're obviously delighted. Uh, the, 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 the significant one, of course, the, the 80-20 is very significant on question one, but we've been looking for the, the votes on question two, and I think the gap there is quite substantial. A drop, of course, and, and an increase in the no vote, but the gap is still very substantial indeed. Now, I stress, of course, it, one, one result, one council, a very small council, but not necessarily, a, a, but a pointer, perhaps, to the way the night is going, both on question one and question two. Well, we can bring you those graphics now from Peter Snow that we couldn't bring you earlier. Peter. I'm oh, sorry about that. We have got things working again now, and I can just show you the background now on the turnout, and also the, with the, the, the target for the yes votes, which do look very, very hopeful indeed for the, for the yes votes, indeed, if we got that check man result. There's the turnout in the 1979 referendum, 63 percent turnout uh, in the 1979 referendum. Of course, it wasn't enough because they didn't get the 40 percent of the electorate they had to get, so it didn't go through, even though it was just a yes. In the local elections in 1995, a typical Scottish local election turnout, nearly 46 percent. General election in 1997, back in May, was 71.4, and now we have the turnout today. The official turnout looks like 62%. There's 1% less than it was in 1979, but my goodness, it looks as if the yes votes are massively away ahead of the nose if Clack Bannon is any kind of representative uh, place. Here's a Scottish Parliament then, and here are the answers to that question from just one place, Clack Bannon. Now, we put in here the winning post. We reckon turnout of 62% will mean that Two and a half million, 2.4 million people roughly will have voted, so 1,200,000 votes will be enough. It'll change as the night goes on. We'll refine that down a bit for the yes to win. 
Here we have just 18,000 in Clackmannan, a small start, but look at the difference between that and the no votes in Clackmannan. It's looking very good indeed, even though Clackmannan is one of the more positive, one of the most positive uh, areas in Scotland. A yes majority of 60% there in Clackmannan, a green light then from that area of Scotland to a Scottish Parliament. Tax varying powers, a little less of a majority for the yeses, but still a mighty hefty one. 16,112 in Clackmannan, turnout 66% there, rather uh, above the average in Scotland, we reckon, 7,355, a 68 to 31, the shares and the majority then for the yeses in Clackmannan on the second question, tax varying powers, 37.4%. Peter, thank you very much. Brian Wilson, your first result in. Mm. There were worries when the two-question referendum was put forward that really Tony Blair was not that keen on tax-varying powers. This seems to be, albeit a different differential, a resounding yes for tax-varying powers from the people of the central belt of Clackmannan. Well, just the, the, the preamble to that is that I think what's going to happen tonight is not only going to be a vote uh, in favour of a Scottish Parliament and in favour of tax-varying powers, but it's also going to confirm how right it was to have a referendum and give it the legitimacy which these votes will, will entail. And I'm particularly delighted that on the second question for such a decisive majority, people have grasped the argument that to have a Parliament you must give it fiscal responsibility. Well, and that's a very well good Well, we start. can see, uh, we can take a picture now of Donald Dewar. Um, he's leaving, he's looking, uh, you know, never, never one to be too ecstatic, still looking uh, very pensive. Um, but do you think that Donald Dewar, if indeed there is a Scottish Parliament, could refuse the post of a First Minister in a I, Scottish Parliament? I, I would never speak. A very good friend of mine. <laughs> You'd never I, speak for Donald great, Dewar. He's a great man. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I can't think of anyone better for the job. <laughs> right, we can go straight over now to Alan Mackay, who's joined by the General Secretary of the Labour Party in Scotland, Jack McConnell. Alan. Thanks, Christy. Uh, just as Donald Dewar went past there, he said to Jack McConnell, uh, a good start, but only a start. Uh, Jack McConnell, what's your feeling about the Clackmannanshire result? Well, it is a good start, but it is only a start. It's a very high turnout, which I think is a good sign. It's a very firm and conclusive result on the first question, but it's also a very strong result on the second question. And uh, I think we see in a constituency here, which is a strong Labour constituency in the central belt of Scotland, but with a rural area within it, we see a very strong positive result for the government. So it's maybe not such a good guide if it's a strong Labour area and also traditionally an SNP area in the past. Well, I think tonight we would, have been, we would have been very happy after the events of the past fortnight with a result here perhaps of a turnout of about maybe 60%, perhaps on the second question a, a, a positive result of about 60%. So we've exceeded expectations already. That's a good start for us, but it is only the first and the smallest constituency in Scotland. Have these turnout figures quelled any fears you had in the last two or three days about the possibility of a poor turnout? Well, I don't think we had any fears that the people of Scotland want a parliament and they wanted to show their support today. Uh, there is perhaps a degree of complacency around about our ability to win this vote. But people had to turn out and they have turned out today. They've backed the government, backed the government scheme and we're now well on the way. Give us a guide then to which county area we should look out on the tax question when you will be even happier than you appear to be now. Well, I think there are a number of interesting accounts to come in the next while. The uh, East Renfish account will, of course, be, I think, particularly interesting. Uh, but I think across Scotland we'll see a reasonably consistent pattern. There will be some areas that will have differences of opinion. Uh, Clark Manager may be one of the more positive results in the course of the evening, but it is a good indication of the strength of support for the government's proposals, the Labour government's proposals here in Scotland. Jack McConnell will leave it there, thanks very much, and we'll await the next result and the reaction to it from the pro-devolution parties. Back to you in the studio, Kirsty. Thank you very much. Now tonight, Donald Finlay, a leading no-no uh, campaigner, said about this first result that it was very disappointing. Uh, Lord Mackay, will you concede now? No, no, no. I think there's a bit to go yet. I think Clack Manon is but both small and also it's a very strong Labour SNP area. What I think will be interesting to, to, to watch is how much the no vote on the first question and indeed in the second question exceeds the Conservative vote at the last election. And that will of course show that some of the people in Brian's camp then, James's camp, less so I think in Hugh's camp, in fact were no's. And it wasn't just the Conservatives who were unhappy about this. Indeed, I suspect some Conservatives probably voted yes. Right, South Lanarkshire declaring, another Central Belt seat declaring now. So we can go straight back over to the Edinburgh International Conference Centre. People are moving forward now because they know, in fact, that North Lanarkshire is out declaring. It is actually North Lanarkshire is I about to declare. A large council, one of the largest five in Scotland, is about to declare. This is a significant result. was 63.1% of those eligible to vote. Here is the result for the first ballot. The votes cast for I agree that there should be a Scottish Parliament, 114,000.
908, representing 77.8% of the ballot votes cast. The votes cast for I do not agree that there should be a Scottish Parliament, 32,762, representing 22.2% of the valid votes cast. Rejected ballot papers, 587. Here is the result for the second ballot. The votes cast for I agree that a Scottish Parliament should have tax varying powers, 99,587, representing 67.6% of the ballot votes cast. The votes cast for I do not agree that a Scottish Parliament should have tax varying powers, 47,708, representing 32.4% of the valid votes cast. Rejected ballot papers, 960. Right, let's look that at that then the in South Lanarkshire, the fifth one. largest uh, counting area in Scotland. A majority for yes to a parliament of 82,146. A majority for should it have tax weighing powers, 51, nearly 52,000, a turnout of 63%, just roughly the same as a referendum. Now let's look at that in percentage terms. 78% for a parliament, 22% against, 68 for tax powers, 32 against. John Mackay, do you think there's going to be a winning no vote tonight? Anywhere in Scotland? No, I just mean overall. Oh, overall? Oh, I thought you meant anywhere in Scotland. Well, frankly, Kirsty, um, I will be quite surprised, as I indicated right at the beginning, if, uh, if we can win this, given the three, party, three other parties are against us, given the, the printed media are pretty hostile, almost universally, and, and given what uh, well, I accept has been the cultivated view over the last 20 years. Well, let's, let's just uh, go over now to one area in which you would expect to uh, have a large no vote, and that indeed is East Renfrewshire, and we can join Ken yeah. MacDonald in East Renfrewshire. Ken? Yes, Kirsty, as I was saying earlier, the turnout here, fairly high, 68.2%, and it does look as if the first yes vote will be fairly comfortable, but the second one looks a lot tighter. With me is Jim Murphy, the Labour MP for Eastwood, which is a very rare bird, and uh, Lawrence Honeyford, the, the chairman of Eastwood Conservative Association. First of all, Jim Murphy, do you agree that uh, perhaps things are not looking quite so comfortable as it has been in other parts of the country on that second question? Well, they haven't even started bundling those second um, reply slips or voting slips, so we'll wait and see. But initially, I'm very pleased with the turnout. More than two-thirds of the people here in East Renfrewshire came out to vote. And that defies the pundits, who were very negative, said to be a limited turnout. And what we have today is a very strong sentiment that the people of East Renfrewshire care about the future of Scotland and the new democracy that perhaps could be born tomorrow. Lawrence Honeyford, isn't perhaps one of the ironies of this going to be that if somebody had actually mounted, perhaps the Conservatives, a yes-no campaign, it might well have won. Well, well, we still haven't had the result for, I mean, it still might well be a yes-no um, result. Um, what are you thinking, it might have been a no-no result? Well, it, it doesn't it look as if it's going to be a yes-yes result? And, and indeed, it's ironic, isn't it, that we've had a yes-yes mm -hmm. campaign, a no-no campaign, even a no-yes campaign, but not a yes-no campaign. Okay. Well, no, the, the, philo the, the policy was, from Think Twice, was to go for a no-no campaign, and that's what we believed in from the outset. So we weren't going to change our beliefs. Jim Murphy, you say you're quite happy with 68.2%, but that means just about one person in three couldn't be bothered to come out to vote on the future of the country. Okay, you always have a small number of people who don't come out, but everyone recognises that this has been a very unusual campaign indeed, with the tragic Jim events Murphy. of last week, and that's had an effect on this. Jim Murphy, thank you very much. From Barhead, back to the studio. Thank you very much. Now we can bring in David Denver, a political analyst from uh, Lancaster University. We've had Scotland's smallest mainline council, Clack Manon. We've had the fifth largest council, South Lanarkshire, and we're awaiting East Renfrewshire. What might East Renfrewshire tell us? Well, East, East, East Renfrewshire will tell us if the, 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 these victories are going to be universal, because if there's any significant council, I don't mean the tiny ones like Orkney, any significant council that might produce uh, a sort of uh, largish no vote in the second question, then it would be East Renfrewshire, because it's the kind of, well, it's the council where there's, there's a, a very high Conservative vote and absolutely no SNP tradition at all. Uh, of course, I have to say that Jim Walsh was taking great exception when he, he was talking about perhaps the I small council being insignificant. In and of course, <laughs> Orkney, of course, would yeah. come, into it, come into its own, presumably, under a system of PR. So we, we must uh, leave that aside and look at John Mackay who's shaking his head dreadfully at the very idea. 
no, no, it, it, it doesn't come into its own as a, as a system of PR. It gets one member, as I understand, in these proposals. But what PR does, it does mean that the, where the majority of people uh, reside is where the majority of members come from. And that is proportional representation, meaning of the word proportional. Well, let, let, let's, let's, we've now been joined by Dr. Alan McCartney of the SNP. John Swinney has gone to uh, speak to another area, radio, in fact. Just let's get up to speed with you. You've had uh, these two results. We're expecting East Renfrewshire. Put your own spin on it. I'm just delighted. I mean, we've been waiting 18 years, you know, for this moment, and it's really <laughs> tremendous that Scott is saying yes, yes. I think quite emphatically. And uh, those of us who uh, bore the scar, bear, still bear the scars of the last referendum campaign, I think, can put that behind us and say we're going to get it this time. Donald Dewar, of course, says saying that he wants to see a few more results before oh. he wants to make any assumptions. Jim Wallace. Yes, I think that's quite right. But I think, I mean, you just need to look at these. It's quite substantial. And there's about a 10% differential in the, between the two questions. But that still would bode well for a, a yes, yes outcome. But I think we're, I mean, we're all the same. I mean, we all don't like to count our chickens before they're hatched. And uh, it gives a few more. And I think um, the smiles will be even broader in our faces than they, they are at the moment. The, the turn, Brian Wilson. The turnout is so important because at the start of this evening, when uh, Michael Ankrum was sitting here, but the straw he was clutching at was that it was going to be a very low turnout. It's, it's a very good turnout. Well, well let, let's say uh, we, we uh, can go over now to Peter Snow, who's going to put some more flesh in the bones of uh, these results. Kirsty, we're in no doubt about the way it's going to go on question one. Here we have then the first question, the Scottish Parliament, uh, and this is the votes that are stacked up so far. Yes, there are the green lights in the front there, there are the red lights behind there. It's a total of a hundred and... 33,000 odd for yes, only 37,000 for no, only two local areas declared so far, turnout is 63%. That's a majority for the yeses when you look at the 78 versus 21, 22, a majority for the green light yes of 56.2%. We're now forecasting on the basis of those two and all the other evidence we have that the final result of this one is going to be a very, very powerful yes to a Scottish Parliament <coughs> with a 77 to 23 vote, a majority of 54% for Scottish Parliament. So, Jim Wallace, on the first question, BBC now forecasts there will be a Scottish Parliament. I'd be absolutely delighted. It's what my party's been campaigning for for 100 years or more, and it really, to, I mean, that seems even more than, I think, even my wildest expectations uh, a couple of days ago. If that, if that, at the end of the day, is the margin, it's really good news. Well, let's go over and see what they make of it at the Scotland Forward Party, and we're joined by John Sopel. John, hello, come in from the, uh, the party. I think John perhaps has been uh, enjoying himself so much there that he's lost his voice. The band is getting very noisy here, but you should have heard the volume of sound when the first couple of results were declared, because I swear the, the roof of this particular building is about six inches higher now. Such was the cry that went up. I'm joined by Colin Donaty, who's been uh, here with me, and Norma Price. Norma Price, what were you feeling just before the result came? I was terribly nervous. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Really? Yeah, honestly. It was really fraught. The tension in that room was incredible. Would I be Were you the same? Uh, just emotional. I, I was just kind of uh, bracing myself for the result. I I couldn't really envisage that it was going. I had I had fearful result, uh, fearful feelings about today. But tonight, I think I'm beginning to relax now. <laughs> and we're not doing it just for Scotland. We're doing it. I think it's going to have the, the effect. It's just going to trickle right through the whole country. We're not just doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for the whole of the country, you know, the whole of England and everything. In the 1992 general election, people talked about Basildon being the moment when people realised there was going to be another Conservative government. Do you think people are now going to remember Clack Manor? Oh yes, I'm really proud of them tonight. And you can't have too much democracy. That's just a problem with this country. Everything's been far too centralised. And that's why people are so apathetic. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think... Uh, I, I had, as I say, I had feelings today that uh, there would be a low turnout or whatever, but, but you know, we're having figures 60% and, you know, it's, it's a good turnout and it's, I, so far it looks good. <laughs> so if, as the politicians say, if the first two results that we've seen are representative, it's going to be quite a party here tonight, isn't it? Yeah, we'll be here all night, I should think, yeah, enjoying himself. What time will this party end? Oh, about 6am, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I feel awake now, anyway. I was sleepy earlier, but I'm awake now. I'm ready for the rest of the night. Both of you, thank you very much. Kirsty, back to you in the studio.
Well, now having made the forecast that there's going to be a yes to the first question, we can go over to Jeremy Vine in Westminster and see what the politicians there make of it. Jeremy. Yes, Kirsty. Well, John Rebel was just t talking about his reasons uh, why he opposes devolution, and then the results came through to show that John Rebel and everyone disagrees with you. Well, in Scotland, there seems to be a strong vote in favour of those who voted. But it does look as if a large number of Scottish people didn't bother to vote at all, and some people voted no. Not that We will not, now explore the detail of the legislation, because, of course, they've gone ahead with this ballot without setting out all the details of the legislation, and we will find that a lot of the things don't add up. What it amounts to is that Scotland will now have more politicians and more bureaucrats and more meddling, but it won't make the health service better, it won't make the education service better. Uh, we need to get on with addressing the real issues, making sure that people have a better life and better public services, instead of just hiring loads of politicians and civil servants. Simon Hughes, for the Liberal Democrats, you've, you've backed the whole thing, but this 3p up, 3p down figure is a bit arbitrary, isn't it? Why, why, why give a parliament the power just to raise taxes or lower taxes by 3p? Why not make it 20p? No, it is arbitrary and it's a nonsense really. You should be able, if you're a parliament, to set the levels of taxation and, and the Labour Party are very nervous about this. They were hugely nervous in the general election they're still nervous in Scotland. But it would have been an even bigger nonsense if the vote in Scotland hadn't delivered the right to vary taxes because if we're going to have a parliament in Scotland, which it looks as if we are, if we're actually going to have probably a majority of the electorate just about voting for it, which it looks as if we are, which is very good news, then not to have had the tax varying powers would have been a nonsense. Now, let's start with 3P. I hope that eventually that will be thrown away and they will have the freedom to be able to set the taxes for what they want in Scotland. Because if they want a better health service, John Roadwood rightly says, it's the issues that matter. It's not the mechanism. It's so the services that matter. They've got to be able to raise the money to provide the services the Scots people want. Well, Peter Haynes has been running like a Cheshire cat yes. throughout all these, all these results nice. going in. But, uh, but what Simon Hughes uh, is saying there will worry some people, the idea that this is just a first step to something else. Well, let's be clear. To change that tax arrangement, you would need Westminster's consent. The legislation will stick to the 3P uh, margin, and that will be what goes through Parliament. So what we have here is a really exciting process of Britain liberating itself from centralised, central London control. And, and not bureaucratic, not bureaucratic. Not bureaucratic, like bureaucratic at all. Goodness me, when John Redwood was in charge of the Welsh shoppers, we had the most appalling bureaucratic control that imposed all sorts of offensive policies in health terms, in school terms, in jobs terms on Wales. What we're now seeing is an opportunity for everybody in Britain to begin to take some influence and power over their own lives. And where Scotland is leading tonight, Wales, I'm sure, will follow next week because Wales will not want to get left behind. John Redwood? Well, what I was doing in Wales was delegating more authority and responsibility to Welsh councils and to Welsh individuals, companies and families. That is proper devolution. Well, I'm all in favour of that. Campaign, then, Want yeah. far less government from the centre. And of course in Wales, having government concentrated in Cardiff won't suit people in North Wales or West Wales. They have a very different feeling about their true. parts of the country. We will see parts of Scotland tonight that I'd don't like share this general Wales, enthusiasm. I'd like you go to out to Shetlands and Orkneys and, and they're not just, very let keen on Edinburgh. Simon Hughes a question. Do, do you think, Simon Hughes, people in England have been at all interested in this debate? I think a lot of them have been. There are lots of people in England who have Scots blood and Welsh blood and actually expatriate Scots and Welsh people. I'm a living example of them. And I think it's very important that we recognise the nations of the four countries of Britain and give them power. And it will be relevant even if they're not yet interested because it will raise issues about how England governs itself and relevant about how the regions of England govern themselves. And certainly London, certainly the South West, certainly the North and Yorkshire and the North East. There is very East Anglia, very strong regional feeling. And I think it will start, and I agree with uh, uh, Peter's view, it will start unshackling us from this view, which isn't all the great democratic system that John argues. It's actually governed by civil servants at the moment, and this will be governed right. by people who can be sacked by the electorate. But what is this regional no. identity? If you live in the northwest of England, uh, you either live in Liverpool or Manchester or, or some other settlement. But you don't them. want Liverpool and Manchester serious? lumped this together people, under a common government. This is about people, people don't want that. Some extra it's not about people taking over influence. their own lives. It's about civil you're servants so and bureaucrats. You, if you're so confident about your position, influence. I invite you now, and Dave, I'll pay your expenses. Come to Wales next week and campaign for your ideas and, and I bring think Mrs. we will increase we'll, yes, vote if we will we'll, we'll find out later on Wales, as I've been doing this evening and you're going to go there okay. are a lot of people in Wales who do not Wales. want to be Gentlemen, governed by Peter Hayne, John Redwood, Simon Hughes thank you very much Kirsty.
And now we can hear from Alex Salmon, the leader of the SNP, and he's with Anne McKenzie at the Conference Centre in Edinburgh. Anne. Thanks, Thanks Christy. Well, well, Alex Salmon, presumably uh, euphoria over the press couple of results. Well, I'm delighted, and like everyone here, there's a, a growing sense of excitement because it looks like we're going to have the first parliament restored to Scotland in 300 years, and it's not going to be done with a whimper, but with a bang. A word of caution, though, both these results are central belts, and I suppose you could say Labour, SNP, strongholds. Other parts of the country, the no campaign we're suggesting earlier, might be less enthusiastic, including the rural areas where you are strong. Well, in my constituency, we know from the, the sample and the indications, we voted four to one for a Scottish Parliament, and we voted decisively on the second question as well. So it's very silly to look at this urban-rural split. Of course, there are going to be areas which have still got a few Tories hanging about, which are going to have higher votes against. But it's not an urban-rural split, it's a political split. Uh, where are you going to see the biggest majorities? In the areas of the Scotland where the Tories no longer exist. And where you'll see smaller majorities are the areas where the Tories still have a remnant of organisation which is mobilising their vote. Right, so assuming you're right, and it is yes, yes, are we now uh, on the motorway to independence? That's Tam Dale's phrase. I mean, what I've said is that this is a process of constitutional change. You've said this is the first step on the road to independence. Oh, certainly, uh, but only if the people of Scotland wish. I mean, Scotland could only become independent. There's no backstairs route to it if and when a majority of my fellow country people decide to vote for independence. Now, I believe that will happen, and I'll argue passionately for that case. And I think... Uh, Tonight is a, a firm step in the right direction. But what would you say to your campaign workers on the street, say, who might be worried tonight that what has happened is that devolution is going to give the Scots just enough to pacify them rather than the status quo infuriating them, as it were, toward independence? Well, I wouldn't say too much to them tonight because they'll be very busy celebrating and I, I'm not sure my words will be fully taken in. But what I would say is, look, uh, that I think we've started and embarked on a journey uh, and I think the end destination of that journey will be Scottish independence but it's up to us to argue our case positively, constructively to make sure we can carry the country with us. That's part of the democratic process but you know SNP voters as we know from all the opinion surveys uh, rallied enormously uh, to the yes cause uh, and although this victory is far far greater than the SNP but nonetheless, the SNP component of it has been absolutely critical. It has been said, though, that the SNP are going to be able to make use of uh, any dissent between Edinburgh and Westminster and will play on that, blame Westminster if, things, if it isn't a land flowing with milk and honey under a Scottish Parliament. Well, uh, what I prefer to argue is that uh, if the Scottish Parliament demonstrates that it can uh, control some of our own affairs better than Westminster has ever done, then it seems to me more likely that people in Scotland will say, well, if we can succeed with some things, can we succeed better with everything else as but well? they might equally well, say, well, 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 that's enough, isn't it? We don't need any more. Well, Why well, take any yeah, more risks? Well, well, they might say that. Uh, and I'm confident that I can take my case to the people of Scotland, that the SNP can argue our case for independence and persuade a, a majority of the people of Scotland to back independence. That, I mean, that's the, uh, the art of politics, is to argue your case and accept the will of the majority. The temptation will be enormous, though, won't it, to blame Westminster if things go wrong. If, for example, a, a tax rise is necessary, you can say, well, Westminster isn't giving us enough money. If, if you can't do something you want to do as a parliament, blame Westminster. That's what happens with local government. Well, it's quite interesting, it? of course. I mean, you, you talk as if blaming Westminster was going to be a new feature of Scottish politics. I mean, I think Westminster, London government, Lady Thatcher, the big T, was blamed for the poll tax, and I think quite rightly. Uh, if Westminster does something wrong, and there are many areas of competence will remain under Westminster, then they'll get the blame. But what I think is that this process will build Scottish confidence in a constructive sense. And one of the best things about this process is we won't have London, Westminster, the English to blame. We'll make mistakes, and we'll put them right ourselves, and we'll grow up as a people and a nation. And briefly, when do you expect them, the marriage with Donald Dewar to end? When is the divorce? Well, we've been getting on very well, actually, over the, over the last few weeks, so who knows? But look, there is a serious point. Constructive opposition is necessary in Scotland, desperately necessary, when you look at the shambles that Labour has made of West Central Scotland. That constructive opposition will continue. But where there are points of agreement, why shouldn't that continue as well? OK, Alex Salmon, thank you very much for thank joining you. us. Across now to, to Alan Mackay, who is, I believe, still in the lobby. Thanks. Uh, and I'm still out in the lobby here, as you say, and it's very busy with people of all parties taking in the results so far. I'm joined at the moment by Bernard Jenkin, MP, the Conservatives' Constitutional Affairs spokesman. Mr Jenkin, not very good news for you so far. Well, no. Uh, if the results continue at this rate, it's clear that uh, the devolution campaign has scored a big hit. Uh, but we've 
been conducting our campaign against a 20-year background of unrelenting propaganda in favour of devolution, so it would be surprising if the devolution campaign did not succeed and get a good result tonight. You've been campaigning on the streets of Scotland over the last few days. What did you see and hear? Well, a mixture, really. A lot of people not clear of what they're voting about, and of course nobody knows what we're voting about because the legislation hasn't yet been published. So there will still be a duty for the official opposition to look very carefully at what has been put to Parliament and to look at all the detail, uh -huh. but we will have to pay I'll heed. I have to stop you there. Thank you very we'll much. Have to pay heed to the result. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Now back to you in the studio, Kirsty. Now we can go to the far southwest of England. Oh, we can now. We don't need to go there. We've got, we've got a bit of line dancing going on at the party. Dear me, this is a, um, a step dancing, line dancing, whatever you call it, going on at the party there. And uh, right, well, uh, perhaps they've been looking at uh, the summation of what's been going on so far, and that's why they're dancing. The share of the vote for a parliament after two results is 78% plays on 22%, and for tax varying powers, 68 plays on. 32% against tax paying powers. After all, this is only after two results. Uh, so that's all we have at the moment is two results. Now we can go over to Cornwall, where Michael Crick's with a group of Cornish people to see what they've been making of it so far. Michael. Well, I'm here in, uh, I'm here in uh, Mevagissi, uh, which is a Cornish uh, fishing village, joined by a number of local politicians, uh, businessmen and uh, other interested parties. Uh, William Rogers, you're, uh, you were just, uh, you've just been appointed by William Haig as the uh, economics and business uh, spokesman for this part of the world for the Conservative Party in the absence of any uh, Tory MPs in Cornwall at the moment. You saw the man in the bar in, in, uh, with John Sopel mm. saying it was wonderful news for the whole of the United Kingdom. Do you see it like that? I have to say no, I don't. I mean, obviously, apart from the two clearly potential problems of constitutional upheaval and certain degree of resentment among probably the English population who are heavily subsidising the operation of Scottish public services, and I think that's bound to be a problem. I think the thing that worries me most is that it does probably now mean that the Labour Party will press on with their proposal to set up a regional assembly. And what Cornwall needs like a hole in the head is an assembly talking shop full of politicians who have frankly not really got to grips with many of the difficulties and probably aren't likely to, somewhere in Bristol or Swindon or Bournemouth, which is just about as far away from Cornwall in real effective terms as Edinburgh. Philip Payton, you, you run the uh, Institute of Cornish Studies. Is there a, a great clamour in Cornwall now for a Cornish Assembly to follow the, the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly? Well, I think what uh, will happen as a result of this uh, uh, result that's emerging is that the territorial relationships uh, in these islands as a whole are going to come under the spotlight. And I think when that happens, people in Cornwall will recognise that uh, for a long time that they have felt that Cornwall has been marginalised in UK political debate, that Cornwall's been overlooked, it's been forgotten, that it's been invisible and that devolution to the regions is an opportunity for Cornwall to assert itself. And I think people in Cornwall recognise that Cornwall have a very strong regional, some would say national identity, which could actually be used to good purposes to put Cornwall on the map, not just in the UK, um, but in Europe as well. So I think we will, we will uh, find people calling for an assembly, but I think like William Rogers, it won't be a South West assembly that people will be interested in, it will be a Cornish assembly. Terry Jones, you were a, a, a Lib Dem candidate at the election, you're a local councillor. There doesn't seem to be any great clamour here, though, for a, a Cornish Assembly. Is that what you want? Well, I think what we want to recognise is that Cornwall, for, for many, many years, has been overlooked by central government, whatever colour has been in, and the pay in this area is about 23% lower than the national average. And what the Cornish people want is recognition for the depth of poverty and problems we have. The way that we're currently lumped in with a region means that those statistics hide and mask the fact of the poverty and the unemployment we have in this area. So, so you would want a Cornish Assembly? I would want something that recognises the deep poverty and problems, particularly in the area that I was representing in Cornwall. We have three of the unemployment black spots in the country and it's an absolutely essential that Cornwall is recognised. We cannot be part of these statistics of a southwest region. And I'm very disappointed in the Labour Party who up to the run-up to the election were campaigning on a Cornish development agency and a recognisable mm, body for Cornwall absolutely. and have actually reneged on that and that is something that I think they should answer. Chris, Chris Vegan, answer it. Well firstly can I say I'm delighted that the Scottish people have taken the chance or seem to have taken the chance offered to them by the Labour government to take more control over their own lives rather than be dominated by Westminster and Whitehall as has been the case for far too long. Now regarding a Cornish Assembly and or a South West Assembly that is what I would like to see as soon as possible 
But which? I mean, is it Cornish or Southwest? There's a vast difference, surely. I think it's more likely to be a Southwest Assembly. Rather but than why Cornish not a Cornish Assembly? I think, really, Cornwall is too small for its own Assembly. I think that's what will be decided by the people of the Southwest, and including Cornwall, that it's too small for a viable well, Assembly of it. If I, if, I can, if, I, if, I, if I can finish, one. if I can finish there, that it will be too small to have its own Assembly, and it's more likely to be a Southwest Assembly. Having said that, that's a vast improvement on the current situation that we have now. What we have now is Whitehall telling us what to do. The last 18, 19 years, we've seen all powers, or many, many powers, taken away from local authorities, local elected representatives, elected there by local people, and transferred centrally to Westminster and Whitehall. We want to give Philip them powers yeah, back. Uh, Philip Payne, yes. Is, I mean, is, is Cornwall too small for a Cornish Assembly? No, it's not. I mean, the, the whole thing of smallness is a red her herring. When we think that Luxembourg has a territorial size and a population very similar to Cornwall, and yet is a member in its own right of the European Union, we can begin to recognise that in the modern world with modern communications, globalisation and all the rest of it, smallness is not a factor. Uh, it, it's an entire red herring. In fact, if we look elsewhere in Europe, we see a whole array of regions which are actually the same size as Cornwall, or smaller. Well, um, what evidence is there that anybody here wants a Cornish Assembly? Well, I think there's quite a lot of evidence. Um, the Liberal Democrats, for one, in the last general election made quite a strong play on um, a Cornish Development Agency. Um, Andrew George, who won the seat of St. Ives from the Conservatives, in his maiden speech spoke very strongly in favour of a Cornish Assembly. And I think that there is certainly a, a very deep feeling of anti-metropolitanism, if I can put it that way. OK, well, well, thank you very much indeed. And now back to you, Kirsty, in Scotland. Well, from the warmth of a Cornish pub, we go outside uh, under Carlton Hill in the shadow of Arthur's seat to speak to John Pinar, who's with the vigilantes who've been there since 1992 during the last election. John Pinar. Well, a little rain now falling here on Calton Hill, Kirsty, but uh, the mood getting very chipper, I think, as time goes by and those results come in. People do seem to be in a rather good mood. The signs are of a good turnout, just the kind that they would wish. Now, over here, for example, there's uh, some supporters of the vigil for whom this event seems to be something of a family experience. This one's name is Douglas, I'm told. What does this mean to you now? The result seems to be going your way. Yeah, well, I mean, it's early days yet. There's only been two results, but certainly the t and turnout seems to be good, uh, a lot better than perhaps we were expecting earlier on. So fingers crossed that it's a resounding yes, yes vote. And for you too, obviously, just what you were hoping for. Yes, I'm very pleased so far, but it is just a couple of results so far. But it's, it's good to have a good, strong turnout compared to what was being predicted. And so many, so much of a, uh, a proportion for yes in the second question is very encouraging. Now you can see in the background, Kirsty, there's almost as many Welsh people here as Scots. I mean, there's a fairly strong contingent just over here who've come along to give their moral support to the vigil. Let's just find out what they make of the, uh, the exercise so far. Here is Murray James, who you noticed earlier on. Murray, what's your reaction to the results as they're coming in? It's very, very exciting. I can't understand why people here are so calm. Um, they're, they're, they're quite quiet at the moment, and we were very excited. I've been talking to colleagues in Cardiff, and the, the, the size of the turnout uh, was, was, was a very good sign. We, we were told earlier today that it was going to be a low turnout, but people are coming out to express their own views about the way they want their own country governed. That's what we're going to have the opportunity to do in Wales next week. And will it's the very, results very here, will it set the kind of example that uh, you need in Wales, where things do seem to be rather more delicately poised? Well, what, what it certainly will do is, is to show that um, people can take the opportunity when, when they're offered it to take over the government of, of their own country, to take democracy um, where, when it matters. And, and that, that's what this is all about, is whether the people of Wales and the people of Scotland want to govern their own country. So obviously we're going to take notice. Two, two yes votes aren't enough for us. We have to have the triple. Well, you sound very optimistic, Murray, but uh, I think you'd be grateful for this kind of enthusiasm, at least here at the vigil, uh, in, in mo many parts of Wales, isn't that so? There isn't quite the, the force behind the, the Yes to Wales campaign, as we seem to be seeing here in Scotland. Well, I, I don't know how, how long you've you spent in Wales in the last few weeks, but there's a lot of enthusiasm all over Wales. There's an enormous amount of, of, of work going on. Um, um, we're having the, what we're finding in the meetings and more and more people turning up all the time. That what we are finding is that there aren't people turning up from the no side. Uh, people are coming along because they want to know the reason, they want to know what they can do to make sure that we get the kind of result next Thursday that we're seeing here tonight. Thank you very much, Murray. Now over here we have a, a musical contribution to the events of the evening. Let's just wander this way and see what a the celebrators here make of the results that are now coming in. You've been supporting this campaign now at the vigil for quite some time. You're obviously fairly pleased at what's, what's happening. I'm extremely delighted with what's happening and I must admit that I think that the most important thing is that this whole 
movement towards the Scottish Parliament has been preceded by a marvellous coming together of the political parties in Scotland. And I think that that is a testament to what the vigil itself means. This place has always worked by consensus. And we've seen a marvellous consensual coming together of the politicians in Scotland to support this. And I think uh, at last the politicians seem to be listening to the people. And uh, it's not before time. Well, let's just have a quick word with the, the, the musician of the group who's been uh, playing along and keeping people fairly happy at the, while the rain comes down and the oh, brazier starts to go out. So how's it going as far as you're concerned? Obviously, uh, not I'm too bad. I'm very pleased with the, the results that are coming in. You know, the ones we've had, they're showing a double yes. I feel the turnout would have probably been higher if the canvassing hadn't stopped for a week after Diana's death. Well, you seem to be cheering up the group here. Another car goes by, more car horns hooting in support of what's going on here at the vigil. Kirsty, back to you. And that was the vigil's very own rap artist. And we can now go down to the northeast of England, an area which was uh, set against uh, Scottish Home Rule in 1979. Diana Medill is with a number of people in yet another pub. <laughs> Same pub, Kirsty was still here. We can't do the rounds just yet. Huge interest, yes.